Good morning, everyone. My name is Tina Park, and I'm the Vice President of the NATO Association of Canada and Executive Director of the Canadian Centre for the Responsibility to Protect, based at the University of Toronto. On behalf of everyone at the NATO Association of Canada, I am delighted to welcome you to today's discussion featuring the very distinguished ambassador of the Republic of Korea to Canada, His Excellency Chang Young Lo. The NATO Association of Canada is a nonprofit organization with the central mandate of educating Canadians on the importance of NATO in promoting international peace and security, particularly Canada's role in maintaining the rules-based order with their allies and protecting our key values. Today's discussion with Ambassador Chang is part of our series which examines the future of the Alliance as we cope with new threats and challenges. From dealing with the COVID-19 global pandemic to cybersecurity, Canada and the Republic of Korea face many common challenges. We have the rare opportunity today to hear directly from Ambassador Chang for his candid views and insights. I am joined today by Eric Jackson and Atwit Sharma, two of our colleagues at the NATO Association of Canada. After Ambassador Chang's introductory remarks and a moderated discussion, we will be opening up the floor to questions from our live YouTube audience. So please feel free to type up any questions you may have. Now I will hand it over to our colleagues to introduce themselves and the ambassador. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our series of events discussing the future of Indo-Pacific cooperation. My name is Advert Sharma, and I'm a research analyst and ambassador coordinator at the NATO Association of Canada. And my name is Eric Jackson. I'm the program editor for Canada's NATO and ambassador coordinator at the NATO Association of Canada. Particularly in these trying times, it is more important than ever to promote international cooperation. We are proud to say this is our 15th event in our speaking series that highlights Canada's relations with our international allies. In this regard, we are honored to be joined by His Excellency Ambassador Chang Kyung Rong, Ambassador of the Republic of Korea to Canada. Thank you for joining us, Ambassador. Thank you. His Excellency Chang Kyung Rong was appointed Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary of the Republic of Korea to Canada in June of 2020. Prior to his appointment, Ambassador Chang was a research advisor at the Institute for National Security Strategy in Seoul, Korea, and served as the chairman of the International Cooperation Standing Committee for the 19th National Unification Adv Advisory Council in Korea. Ambassador Chang has also had an extensive teaching career where he became an Associate Professor of Political Science and International Relations at Gwangju Women's University in Gwangju, Korea. During his tenure, the Ambassador took part in a Visiting Professor Fellowship at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. His Excellency also holds a BA in, polit in Political Science and Diplomacy from the Kyung Hee University in Seoul, and an MA in International Relations from uh, the Fairleigh Dickinson University in New Jersey of the United States, as well as a PhD in Political Science from McGill University here in Montreal, Canada. He has received various awards, including the prestigious Korean Presidential Citation. Now, without further delay, Ambassador, we invite you to begin with some opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Sharma. I thank you for your kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. NATO Association of Canada exec executive members, President Baines, Vice President Tina Park, and the moderators, Eric Jackson, uh, Edward Sharma. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today on the future of Indo-Pacific cooperation a Korean perspective, which is a topic of particular interest to myself and I hope to you as well. About three months ago, Korean President Moon Jae-in and the US President Joe Biden held an in-person summit in Washington DC. Afterwards, both parties released the US rock leaders joint statement, which illustrates both countries shared vision and approach for a better future. One key takeaway of the statement is that 
the two leaders agreed to align Korea's new southern policy and the U.S.'s vision for a free and open Indo-Pacific. I cannot emphasize enough the significance of the Indo-Pacific region strategically, economically, culturally, in almost every aspect. It is a region that is simply growing in importance. And considering what we have just witnessed during the G7 and NATO summit in June, world leaders have finally made the region a global priority, right? As for Korea, it is seeking a niche area where it can fully leverage its strength and advantages regionally and globally. And it is looking to emulate other middle powers like Canada, which have emphasized both the values of international cooperation and values-based cooperation. Thus in November, 2017, President Moon unveiled his signature New Southern Policy, or NSP for short, during an official visit to Indonesia. Centered on three core pillars, people, peace, and prosperity, the NSP aims to strengthen mutually beneficial cooperation with all 10 Asian member countries and India. Specifically, the policy's goal is to create a community with upholds human dignity and shared values and to nurture mutually beneficial and future-oriented economic cooperation. In the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, the NSP was later upgraded to the NSP Plus, unveiled by President Moon in November 2020 at the 21st Asian Korea Summit. NSP Plus incorporates actionable measures on seven key areas of cooperation. One, comprehensive health and medical cooperation to tackle the COVID-19 pandemic. Second, imparting Korea's education and human resource development models. Three, the promotion of cultural exchanges. Four, developing mutually beneficial trade relations and investment. Five, cooperation in the development of farming and urban infrastructure. Six, cooperation in future industries and seven, cooperation in non-conventional security. Overcoming diverse non-conventional security challenges in the region includes countering transnational crimes, counter narcotics, maritime security, cyber security, marine environmental protection, water security and digestive response and preparedness. President Moon has conveyed the importance he attaches to the NSP countries through his numerous visits with Asian member countries and summit meeting with India, with Asian as, a, as the core platform bringing all middle and major powers together in the region and by aligning the NSP's three main pillars to correspond to Asia's social, cultural, economic, and political communities, Korea has oriented its future strategic outlook as one that is of complementary nature to Asia. Canada, as one of the Indo-Pacific countries, understand that much is at stake in the region and has engaged bilaterally and multilaterally. With the growing importance of the region, it seems that Canada is keen to take a bigger role. 
Then one of them asked, how can two countries have a synergy in the region to yield productive and meaningful outcomes? To answer this question, I would like to explain what we have achieved together and where the potential lies for future cooperation. Korea's relationship with Canada dates back to the late 19th century when the first Canadian missionaries landed on Korean shores. From the Korean War onwards, Canada has historically stood shoulder to shoulder with Korea in improving peace and security on the Korean Peninsula. Since then, our friendship has grown into strategic partnership based on shared values with a vision for global peace and prosperity. I would like to underscore the fact that our relationship is indeed based on shared values. Well, Canada will encounter different systems, regimes, and cultures when navigating ways to engage in the Indo-Pacific as the region itself encompasses much diversity, right? So if Canada seeks to deepen its engagement in the region, Korea can assist by facilitating greater understanding between East and West while pursuing new pathways for development assistance and infrastructure investments in the region. As Canada takes up a larger role in the Indo-Pacific, Korea stands ready to welcome its long-standing partner to promote the free trade, human rights, and the rule of law in the Indo-Pacific. Together, we can pursue our shared values and shared goals while ensuring a more prosperous, resilient, and peaceful Indo and Pacific. Trade is also of great significance for Canada-Korea relations. Last year, Korea and Canada celebrates the fifth anniversary of the Canada-Korea Free Trade Agreement, CKFTA. Since the CKFTA entered into force in 2015, exports have risen steadily, with Korea exporting over 5.5 billion US dollar worth of goods to Canada, and Canada exporting 5.7 billion US dollar of goods to Korea in 2019. I'm using the year 2019 benchmark as it more accurately reflects free COVID trade between the two countries. It is noteworthy that CKFTA is the only bilateral FTA that Canada has agreed to with an Asia Pacific country so far. At the launch of CKFTA, the government of Canada noted that Korea is not only a major economic player in its own right and a key market for Canada, it also serves as a gateway for Canadian businesses and workers to the dynamic Asia Pacific region as a whole. Canadian companies will be able to take better advantage of Korea as a strategic base for expanding their presence in all of Asia and across its supply chains. As for technology, Korea has a particularly int keen interest in AI. Both Korea and Canada have considerable AI talent. <clears throat> Excuse me. Korea possesses significant hardware capacity as a result of its advanced manufacturing sector. And Canada is well regarded for its strength in fundamental AI research. In 2017, Korea and Canada signed the Science, Technology and Innovation Agreement, 
which ultimately serves as a useful framework to bolster commercialization opportunities between companies from those countries. And our people-to-people -people ties are growing both in quantity and quality. Over 240,000 Koreans live in Canada and approximately 27,000 Canadians reside in Korea. As such, Korea is also the third largest contributing country of international students to, to Canada. Last year, Carleton University announced the creation of the minor in Korean language program, the first of its kind offered in Canada. I can personally attest to Canadians' growing interests in Korean culture. And despite the vast geographical distance, both countries keep getting closer, demographically and culturally. This mutual understanding and affinity continues to be a great asset for deepening our mutual cooperation. I have to point out that one of the areas where Canada and Korea have been working together is on the Korean Peninsula issue. For the past several years, the Moon administration has been trying to deter the North Korea's nuclear ambitions by employing diplomatic overtures, placing a particular emphasis on negotiations. After 2016 through 17, in which North Korea precipitated the international crisis on the peninsula with the deployment of nuclear and long range missile tests, the South Korean government responded by introducing the Korean Peninsula Peace Process Policy. Comprised of three guiding principles, such as zero tolerance for war, mutual security guarantees, and common prosperity. The policy aims to use a three-pronged approach to bring North Korea back to the negotiating table. Under the principle of zero tolerance for war, Seoul has strengthened its military capabilities to bolster South Korea's level of self-defense, including upgrading its military alliance with the United States. These actions meant to deter North Korean provocations have worked to some extent and diminished the probability of an all a war. In addition, to realize mutual security guarantees, the South Korean government has persistently pursued a peaceful resolution to the North Korean nuclear issue through confidence building measures in inter-Korea military affairs. Following the inter-Korean summit, this strategy actually bore fruit as both parties formally reached the agreement to seize all hostile acts and to transform the DMZ into a designated peace zone. And to achieve the last principle of a common prosperity, the South Korean government put forward an initiative for a new economic map for the Korean Peninsula, which envisions the gradual economic integration of the two Koreas by securing a better economic future for the people of North Korea. <clears throat> this initiative pairs the North Korean workforce with South Korean capital and industrial machinery to conduct practical underground projects, such as reconnecting the international railway between North Korea and South Korea. Throughout 2018 and 2019, President Moon, leader Kim of North Korea, and then US President Trump met each other on several occasions 
to discuss the ongoing security situation on the peninsula and to put forward measures to address the North Korea's nuclear program, namely the Panmunjom Declaration in 2018, the Singapore Summit in 2018, and the Hanoi Summit in 2019. Though North Korea and the United States failed to reach an agreement in Hanoi, the South Korean government will to implement the, the Korean Peninsula peace process goes on. Whether it has been to facilitate inter-Korean dialogue or de-escalate tensions on the peninsula, Canada has always advocated for international action alongside Korea. And for that, we will always remain deeply appreciative of Canada's effort. For instance, in 2018, Canada, in conjunction with the United States, co-hosted the foreign minister's meeting on security and stability on the Korean Peninsula in Vancouver. The meeting brought more than 20 foreign ministers together to discuss ways to implement and enforce UN sanctions that were introduced against North Korea in 2006, 2006 and strengthened in 2017. In addition to Canada's critical role in galvanizing international action to fully implement UN resolutions against the North Korean regime, the government of Canada under its commitment to regional security in the Indo-Pacific deployed military ships, aircrafts, and personnel under Operation Neon to identify suspected maritime sanction evasion activities. In these unprecedented times, liberal democratic middle powers like Korea and Canada must continue to uphold and promote our shared values and goals through forums and the multilateral institutions like the UN, G20, APEC, and NATO. We must continue to apply concerted pressure on the regime and force the greater cooperation among other nations if we are to see true verifiable peace in the region. I should note that at the June 2021 NATO summit in Brussels, NATO leaders reaffirmed their full support in the Brussels summit communique for the goal of complete, verifiable, and irreversible denuclearization of North Korea and called upon North Korea to return to the NPT and IAEA and engage in a dialogue with the United States to achieve the goal of denuclearization. While NATO allies are seeking to increase the dialogue and practical cooperation between NATO and existing partners in the Indo-Pacific region, including Korea, Canada's contribution to the Korean Peninsula issue is all the more relevant. And conversely, Korea has contributed to joint NATO missions and uh, initiatives, be it assisting in the reconstruction of Afghanistan, anti-piracy activities in Africa, non-proliferation, cyber defense, and counterterrorism. Korea has been there. Canada's and NATO's increased role in the Indo-Pacific no doubt coincides with Korea's NSP plus strategy in the region. Korea serves as a shining example amongst East Asian countries and represent a model case 
for the success of a liberal democracy and open market economics in the region. Therefore, I very much look forward to future cooperation between Canada and Korea in the Indo-Pacific and PR. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for your wonderful open remarks. I very much enjoyed your presentation there. We are now turn our uh, discussion to a moderated portion of our event before we open the floor to, the, to questions from our live audience. So for all our viewers out there, I encourage you to, from this presentation, get your questions in as soon as possible, and we'll get to as many of them as, as we can. So Ambassador, you alluded to this in your presentation, but the Republic of Korea and Canada have long enjoyed close relations forged by strong people-to-people -people ties, like-minded values, and extensive multi-layered economic ties. How would you define this bilateral bond between our two countries? Well, um, during my remarks, I gave you an overview of our two countries' bilateral relationship. And I believe you all understood how well we are positioned. We are positioned to work together. We share common values, which give us so much room for cooperation. You know, wide variety of areas. And we share comparable geopolitical concerns, powerful neighbors, namely the United States and Canada. So our respective knowledge engaging with these great powers would be of great value if we could share it with each other. So if you look at all these factors, we, you won't be able to deny that Canada and Korea have so much potential to work together. I assume most of you are familiar with your political science and may have heard about Graham Allison's famous book on the uh, uh, US-China relations titled Destined for War. It put, it put forward a red ominous picture for the world ahead of us with a return to great power politics. Well, to define our bilateral bond, you know what? I'd like to give you a little tweak to the title of this book. If a book was going to be written on the Korea and Canada bilateral relationship, it would be safe to say that it would most likely be called destined for cooperation. Well, I hope I have answered, answered your question. Indeed, Ambassador, that is a wonderful response. And uh, I think that's something we can all resonate with. That is a destiny that we hope for. Um, and speaking um, of these relations, our countries enjoy a significant economic relationship um, as you addressed in your opening remarks, and this is seen in the $14.3 billion in exchange goods in 2020 alone, um, which was, of course, you know, marred by the pandemic. So a secure and efficient flow of goods and people between our two countries is vital to our shared prosperity. What would you say, Ambassador, is the impact of COVID-19 <clears throat> on our trade relations? And what do you think can be done in the future to better manage such shocks? Um, and as you also mentioned, various sectors um, of our trade partnership, what kind of sectors do you see room for where there's room for more synergy, aside from, you know, artificial intelligence, um, as well as prospects for cooperation on vaccines? Well, Mr. Sharma, thank you for asking that question. Well, due to the pandemic, the bilateral trade volume between Canada and Korea as you would, would expect, decreased by 5.3% in 2020 compared to 2019. Well, I think it is natural considering that countries had to close their borders and impose the uh, various lockdown measures. This invariable impact the consumer confidence, right? However, if we consider that Korea's total trade volume decreased by 6.2%. The impact of COVID-19 on 
Korea-Canada trade relations was indeed buffered through the FTA. In fact, our bilateral trade is well established due to the FTA. The FTA utilization rate for Korean export to Canada was 95.4%, which was amongst the highest of the FTA countries. Subsequently, Korea's export to Canada in 2020 actually increased from 2019. As mentioned, we've marked the uh, fifth anniversary of the Korean-Canada FTA in January of last year. Bilateral trade has increased by an annual average of 1.9% since the FTA took effect. So I'm confident that Canada and Korea will continue to expand trade and investment through the FTA while exploring key areas to increase economic cooperation in the post-pandemic area. In this regard, I'd like to highlight again Korea's post-COVID economic policy, that is Korea's New Deal, KND, which will allocate 130 billion Canadian dollar in funding centered on two main policy pillars, that is Digital New Deal and Green New Deal. Well, actually many experts argue that the KND could present lucrative commercial opportunities for the Canadian export ready digital, renewable and R&D sectors which could in turn further diversify and expand the existing Canada-Korea trade relations. However, Canadian investments to Korea still remain limited in these sectors. Of the $5 billion worth of Canadian investment in Korea from 2003 through 2020, the digital and clean energy sectors only accounted for $101 million and $113 million respectively. So we need to actively utilize the opportunities available to green and digitalize Canada, Korea investment relations. So I hope your question has been fully answered. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And it's, it's very important to recognize the challenges that COVID-19 presents and, and grow with them and, and become a better society afterwards. And similar to COVID-19, climate change is another such non-traditional threat that has really taken the world by storm. And recently, if I might add, the, the IPCC report saying that it's a climate emergency um, has really brought forth to light the imperativeness of this emergency that we have to deal with. What would you say is the best way forward for both Korea and Canada to address this rise in security concern together? Well, climate change is a rising global threat, as you told, that cannot be tackled by any single country alone. In this regards, Canada and Korea are on the right path by upholding multilateralism. Last May, the p 4 summit hosted by Korea was successfully concluded in Seoul as one of the key milestones in climate action for this year. As a stepping stone to COP26, the summit united the governments, business and civil societies from different countries in an effort to put forward on inclusive green recovery towards carbon neutrality. Jonathan Wilkinson, Environment and Climate Change Minister of Canada, participated virtually in the summit and provided an overview of how Canada has been working to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. 
Canada and Korea both have set goals to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. In other words, we both understand that ambitious climate actions are imperative, not only for our mutual security, but to achieve resilient, sustainable, and equitable economies. As I noted before, the Korean government launched the Korean New Deal, a $130 billion Canadian dollar national strategy, of which one of the main pillars is the Green New Deal. The Green New Deal aims to strengthen climate action and realize your green economy. Investments are centered on green infrastructure, renewable energy, and green industries. Canada is also keen to move forward the green energy transition. And there is definitely room for greater cooperation between most countries in many areas, such as electric vehicles and hydrogen powers. Well, I'm not sure if I fully understand your question. Apologies, Ambassador. Um, would you like a sort of a, a clarification on that? If if not, I mean the answer was absolutely perfect. So I can move on to the next one. And I was just going to mention that um, Canada, through Operation Neon, is a key member in upholding the UN Council security um, UN Council security sanctions imposed against North Korea. Um, can you speak to the importance of this mission? and defense relations between Canada and Korea? Oh yes, between Canada and Korea. I'm sorry, Ambassador. Um, I think there's there must have been a slight audio delay. Um, okay. I, my, my question was to do with um, Operation Neon. Um, and sort of the, the question just talks about sort of Operation Neon. Um, Canada is a key member in upholding okay. the UN um, Security Council in sanctions imposed on North Korea. Um, could you speak to the importance of this mission and defense relations between Canada and Korea through Operation Neon? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. <clears throat> Excuse me, as I mentioned earlier, Canada has been a critical partner in ensuring the peace and security of the Korean Peninsula. On the Operation Neon, Canada is identifying suspected maritime sanction evasion activities in the region. This significant contribution to regional security in the Indo-Pacific continues to, to strengthen the integrity of the global sanctions regime placed on North Korea and is most appreciated by South Korean government, especially considering that the operation has been extended for two additional years. Under the Korean Peninsula peace process, our government will continue to coax North Korea into coming to the negotiating table. But in the meantime, global sanctions regime will serve as effective means to it. Other than Operation Neon, Canada and Korea have a great deal of ongoing cooperation in defense. There are a number of Canadian armed forces officers embedded with UN command in Korea, most notably Wayne Air, acting chief of the defense, who served as the first non-American deputy commander of the command in 2018 through 19. Both countries have defense at the shades in each embassy, and relations have increased to the point that reciprocal training and high-level exchanges are taking, peace regular, taking place regularly. 
also remembering the sacrifice and bravery of Canada's veterans is one of the most important elements of our bilateral defense relations, especially this year, as it marked the 70th anniversary of the Battle of Kaohsiung, which Veterans Affairs Canada has called Canada's most significant action of the Korean War. There have been a series of events to commemorate the battle and share our admi admiration and gratitude towards veterans and their families throughout the year. In addition, our two countries recently agreed to an MOU to expedite efforts to discover and identify the remains of Canadian troops who went missing during the Korean War. Our respective authorities will collaborate in discovering the remains and manage the DNA information for the eventual identification of the fallen. So I would say Canada and Korea defense relations are robust and uh, promoting continuously. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for that wonderful overview of our defense relations. And as our two key members of the Indo-Pacific region, it's really important that we continue to have those strong military and security ties to make sure the region is as secure as possible. Before I, I go on to our final question for this moderating discussion, I want to speak to our live audience, making sure that you get your questions in as soon as possible, because we turn to that shortly, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. So Ambassador, to conclude our moderate dis discussion, I want to get your take on sort of in times of peace, those who are dedicated to the rules-based international order must <clears throat> reaffirm that we are willing to stand up for multilateralism. What must Korea and Canada do to advance this rules-based international order around the world? Well, you know, Korea is a country which respects human rights, freedom, democracy, and the rule of law. In order to advance the rules-based international order, Korea is further enhancing multilateral cooperation with like-minded countries, including Canada, to promote and protect world peace and security. It is vital to maintain close cooperation with our allies, including the United States, EU, and other NATO member countries. As Canada and Korea are like-minded allies with shared values and common goals, both countries have been cooperating very closely in several multilateral forums, including the G20, APEC, OECD, WTO, and the UN. As you know, Korea was invited to join this year's G7. So Korea has now committed to play an even more important role in addressing international and regional security concerns. Well, there are so many issues that need the international community's attention, but I would like to briefly mention a few of them in which Canada and Korea have closely worked together and will deepen its cooperation. In terms of COVID-19 vaccine, no one is safe until everyone is safe, right? Both Canada and Korea are dedicating their efforts to lead global COVID-19 vaccine cooperation through the COVAX initiative. Both countries have committed to achieving, uh, I mean, COVAX initiative, which is being led by the WTO, Gavi and SEPI. And in regard to climate change, both countries have committed to achieving carbon neutrality by 2050, as I told you. And as member countries of the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence, 
both countries are actively promoting the responsible development and ethical use of AI. So all of these emerging global issues can only be addressed um, through concerted international cooperation. Thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador. We really did appreciate all the insights and your inputs for this wonderful conversation. I personally have very much enjoyed it so far. But Thank with you. that, we will bring our Mare discussion to a close and we will now turn it over to our live Q&A portion of the event. And with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Adewit, to ask the first question. Thank you, Eric. And of course, I'd like to once again, encourage our audience to type in your questions. We'd like to get to as many of them as we can. Um, so the first question for you, Ambassador, um, is to do with Afghanistan. Um, what do you think of the current situation in Afghanistan, um, especially as you know, United, the United States and South Korea anyways, we've touched upon, um, cooperate heavily on defense. So what do you think of the current situation in Afghanistan and how can Canada and Korea work to help Afghans protect human rights and promote peace and stability in the region? Well, as I told you, Korea, all the time respect the human dignity and democratic system, and democratic values. So it, to seeing the news on the Afghanistan, I'm very sad. And the, uh, I don't know how to say how deeply I concerned about the situation. And the, I'm not in the position, I'm, I'm not in the position to answer about the United Nations decision making system on the Afghanistan. But the, uh, I believe that there are some rooms for cooperation among like-minded uh, countries like the United States, and Korea, and Canada. Well, as the year President Joe Biden um, always says that we need uh, some kind of a democratic alliance in order to tackle or to uh, cope with the uh, non-democratic system. So as far as we monitoring the uh, current situation on the uh, Afghanistan system, but when there is uh, some very serious threat to Afghanistan people, then we need uh, some kind of uh, democratic alliance or uh, some kind of uh, expression of uh, deeply concerning of the uh, Afghanistan people based on our shared values on human rights and democratic system. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. It is very trying times right now for Afghanistan. We must do everything we can to support those peoples in their ability to, to protect those human rights and to support them as best we can. Moving on to our next question, our audience member asks, the relationship between our two great nations are broad and very deep in many aspects. Looking ahead to the next five years, what do you see as the top priorities that would benefit both our two nations as well as the rest of the Asian nations? Well, I think uh, one thing is that we need here some kind of a deepen the cooperation in coping to deal with the uh, rising uh, uh, rivalry between the United States and the uh, China within five years. The United States, as we all know, the, has been the uh, hegemonic power and the, uh, but the, uh, the China is a kind of a rising power. So I think there should be uh, some kind of a, escalated the rivalry between the uh, United States and, and the, uh, the China. So what I'm thinking, um, the situation of Korea or Canada, like a middle powers, we need to uh, uh, have uh, some cooperative uh, partnership to deal with the, uh, the, uh, the uh, escalated the uh, rivalry between two great powers. And we always to persuade the, uh, those two big powers to have uh, some kind of uh, rule-based uh, international order or rule-based uh, 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 system of uh, yeah, international system. So the first priority is the 
that for us, to, for Korea and Canada, we need to cooperate to deal, to cope with the uh, rising cooperation, uh, right? I mean, the rising rivalry between the uh, two countries. The other one is that as the, I think yet yeah, the pandemic, another pandemic may come in the few years because of the uh, worsening climate change. So we, like uh, Canada and Korea must continue our cooperation to developing the, uh, some kind of vaccines or some kind of therapeutics to cope with the uh, global pandemic, which could come again and again. That's what I'm thinking for our future. Certainly, uh, Ambassador Chang, I think that's a, that's a wonderful response. And sort of speaking um, of those um, relations and you know, cooperation um, to address regional issues, the next question um, is to do with um, North Korea. So under the Trump administration, a reapproachment was witnessed with the DPRK leadership. And although President Moon Jae-in supported these efforts, the Biden administration has not resumed them. Is the Biden administration making a mistake by abandoning diplomacy with North Korea? Is the US demand for denuclearization um, before sanctions relief a mistake? We would love to have your thoughts. Could you repeat the uh, question again, please? So I yes. didn't catch your question. No worries, it is a lengthy one. I, I'll be sure to uh, repeat it. Um, under the Trump administration, a reapproachment was witnessed with the DPRK leadership. Um, while President Moon Jae-in has supported these efforts, the current Biden administration um, has not resumed um, sort of, you know, this diplomacy with North Korea. Do you think that is a mistake? Um, and do you think that the U.S. demand for denuclearization um, before sanctions is a mistake as well? Well, I think... Um, the uh, let me see the uh, let me see the uh, from the uh, South Korea and the uh, the United States uh, um, current year statement on, on North Korea. Um, for my personal opinion, is that we need to both dialogue and international sanction to pursue North Korea to abandon North Korea's nuclear weapons. Because uh, all the time in foreign policy, we need both like a uh, carrot and stick, right? Well, sometimes we need to continue some kind of conversation or dialogue with the enemies, but the, sometimes it has been uh, failed because of uh, some kind of regions or factors. But the, uh, I think from my uh, government position is that we need uh, two kinds of uh, uh, approach. One is the uh, negotiation with North Korea as uh, uh, showed in the uh, North, uh, South Korea's peace, the Korean Peninsula peace process. We need all the time some kind of a dialogue. But when there is a lack of a dialogue, then it gives some kind of a signal or some kind of momentum to recalculate how to deal with South Korea and the United States to the North Koreas, to North Korea. So I do not think not have we uh, temporarily uh, not have we uh, uh, dialogue or temporarily some kind of international sanction are not uh, mistakes. We need both of them. So the problem is that how to we coordinate the two kinds of approach to engage with North Korea. That's what I'm thinking. Thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador. That is a wonderful answer. It's always important to have 
some sort of dual track way of diplomacy to always engage with people around the world. And just as the interest of time, I know we're almost coming up to the hour, but I want to get one last question before we, we start wrapping up the event. And it goes off your recent comments about North Korea. And our audience member asks, a still surviving legacy of the Korean War is the armistice, which hasn't formally ended the conflict. Does South Korea plan to seek a formal termination to the war in the near future? If not, why? Um, well, yeah, I'm sure that there could be a, some kind of a, yeah, a legacy of the Korean War. For example, if we, well, you can imagine that if I got there some attack from the other guys, we have all the time very negative image of the other guy who attack us, right? So that is a very serious uh, legacy from the Korean War. The other thing is that as far as I have negative image of the other guys, then I have to build up my military capabilities, right? So that is the two, the two kinds of very important legacy from the Korean War. But I, including myself, my government all the time believes that we can persuade North Korea to abandon the year each nu nuclear program because we know that as far as yeah, North Korea has kind of some kind of guarantee of each regime or the leadership security, then there is a very large room for, uh, I mean, the uh, uh, abandoning the nuclear system. So we always are trying to give them the uh, some kind of assurance for the security of their regime, for the stability of their leadership. As far as it is successful, then North Korea could accommodate with other and the, okay. and the for the eventual termination of the conflict between North Korea and South Korea, we always trying to have a kind of some declaration on ending the Korean War, because the declaration of ending the Korean War could be a real guarantee of the security for North Korea. So our government is thinking that declaration on the Korean, uh, ending the Korean War is very important. Then we can make another procedure that is the uh, establishing the permanent peace on the Korean Peninsula. We are very confident of that kind of step-by-step step toward the, the eternal peace on the Korean Peninsula. That is why our government is always seeking to declaring ending the Korean War. Indeed, Ambassador Chang, thank you for your uh, wonderful remarks there. Sort of that it's wonderful to hear this multi-step approach. Um, and I think that is sort of what paves the way for peace and stability in the region. Um, in the interest of time, looks like that is all that we have time for. We would like to convey our sincerest thanks to you for agreeing to have this conversation and for your thoughtful responses therein. Um, with that, I will now pass it on to Dr. Tina Park for some closing remarks. Thank you, Ambassador Chang, once again, for your exceptionally insightful presentation and for taking time out of your very demanding schedule to join us this morning. This session will be made available on our YouTube channel and we'll be sure to use it as an educational resource in the coming year. Thank you, Eric and Adwit, for all your hard work in putting the series together and to our audience for joining this very important conversation. For more events and programs, please be sure to follow us on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And have a great weekend, everyone. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.